Podcast Live, everybody! Good to be here with you. I want you to know the Democrats Live comes to you every week. We're bringing the Democratic message. We want you to pump We got some uh, feedback there, but let me tell you, we're fighting on it anyway, right, everybody? Right. And, and so, it's, right. That's right. Exactly. Dude, we want that's feedback. That's right. We want <laughs> feedback. We're, we're the people's organization. You know, so Democrats Live is all about talking to our democratic nation about the values that we share and that we believe are so critically important. We want you to tune in to Democrats Live, to queue in every week. We come to you with strong messaging, and we want you to visit our website. And you can volunteer, you can donate, but we, yeah, that's right, that's part of it. But we want you to know that uh, we are committed to making sure that you hear from leaders in the Democratic Party, some very well known like our guest tonight, and others who are just toiling in that vineyard every single day. Tonight, we have the governor, former governor of Michigan, Jennifer Granholm. A fiercer fighter the American people do not have. She is all on top of making sure that working people get the respect that they need in the economy and in society. Jennifer Granholm, thanks for being hey, here. you bet. Glad to be here. And right now you're like a professor of... Uh, of, of I am. A, I'm at the University of California at Berkeley. And actually, but I was on leave for this year because I was working on the campaign. And um, alas, that didn't work out. So I'll be joining the, the faculty again starting in the fall. Well, welcome to Democrats yeah. Live. And my buddy, Chris Van Hollen, now Senator Van Hollen. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> led the House Democrats in our budget fight against the Republican, actually led the way in terms of economic justice, and was actually one of the people who can explain really complicated economic and budget ideas uh, in a very simple way. And now he's leading the, uh, Senate, the Demo Senate Democrats' efforts to elect 25 Democratic senators back to the U.S. Senate, and we're behind him in and that fight. And pick up three more on and the way. And pick up All three right. more on the way. Yeah. We aim high, man. Come on. If you are in Washington, D.C., come be part of the studio audience of Democrats Live. Yeah. It's a lot of fun, right? Absolutely. So let's uh, get right to a, uh, uh, oh, first of all, I got to give a shout out. Y'all ready for a shout out? All right. So we want to give a special shout out to Physician Women for Democratic Principles. Next month, they're, focus on, they're focusing their memberships on giving the DNC and our digital team uh, has committed to matching their donations with our grassroots fundraising. So give a big thanks to PWDM, that is Physician Women for Democratic Principles, everybody. All right. And so now, as you know, first 100 days, right? Let's hear, let's hear, let's see what Trump had to say through a tweet, which he's so prolific at. Can we queue it up? All right. right no matter how much I accomplished during the ridiculous standard of the first 100 days, and it has been a lot, including <laughs> Supreme Court, media will kill. Oh, poor him. I think he sounds defensive. Yeah, I think he sounds a little <laughs> like a victim or maybe even a loser. Um, so sad. Said, such a sad guy. And so, you know, you know, what do you think? Has the media been too harsh on Trump about his first 100 days, or is he trying to uh, move the goalposts? I think the media can be harsher on him. Honestly, if you look at what he set forth, so in October of 2016, he laid out what his promise to America was, the American voter. It was for what he would do in the first 100 days. In it, he lists 10 pieces of legislation that he will have signed in the first 100 days. How many pieces of legislation from that contract with the American voters has been passed and signed? Zero. <laughs> the man, it is a failure. He said that he was going to do, in fact, you see his, him doing the flurry of executive orders, many of which have been stopped by the courts, many of which he also had in this contract that he has not even done. So he has been a disaster, and I think the media can be much harsher on him. Show the spot, shine the spotlight on how much he has let down his own voters. So wait a minute, uh, Senator Van Hollen, are, are you tired of winning yet, all the winning we were going to do? <laughs> Listen, Remember how much winning we were going to do? Look, it is exactly. I mean, this is a guy who uh, sold himself as the great 
art of the deal, <laughs> maestro, right? Just put me in a room with people and give me a couple hours and we'll be able to do great things uh, for the American people. Uh, the good news for the American people is it's been more the art of no deal because yeah, people right. from all over the country stood up and spoke out and said, we're not gonna let you take away our health care. We're not gonna let you destroy the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we're not gonna let you take uh, research funds away from the NIH where they're used to find cures and treatments to diseases. We're not gonna let you take them away from that to put into your wall. His only infrastructure idea, by the way, has been a wall. Oh, wow. uh, and uh, the good news is the American people are onto that and realize it's a total waste of money. Um, and by the way, Mexico was supposed to pay, pay for, for that the wall, wall, if I recall. That's right. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, he gets a big swing and a miss when it comes to any kind of legislative F minus, don't you agree? Yeah. Grading him F on his first 100 days. Can I just say, sure. there's one other, you know, today, out today, there was a poll from Fox, and it asked the question, if this were 2020 and you had to vote for Trump or a Democrat, who would you vote for? He lost by 19 points. Mm. Trump loses by 19 points. And that's a Fox poll. So I'm just saying. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Well, I know it was hard to believe that about 60% of the people throughout the country um, thought that at least what he, he meant what he said in February. Not that he could they deliver, but that he meant what he said in February. That plummeted. Yeah. People watched him in action. They saw him flip and flop uh, and not be able to deliver. And so that's plummeted. So people already realized that the guy didn't tell the truth, but they sometimes thought maybe he believed in what he said. They don't believe a word anymore. Um, at least, at least, you know, 60 a good plus chunk, percent. Right. I mean, now there's still, there, still, there. still a lot of people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, look, he, he's, a, he's been a con artist. I mean, he did that at Trump University. Um, and we just need to continue you to expose. You mean when he paid the big uh, settlement yeah. for? Yeah. You know what he said? He wasn't going to pay a dime. <laughs> oh, right. he paid yeah. up, didn't he? So, look, I mean, I think the more he goes about betraying the voters who supported him, the more they'll they'll begin to see that and he I is think a fraud. As Democrat, I mean, uh, Senator has uses the word betrayed, and I think that is such an important uh, way that we need to convey it. It's not that people were conned; it's that he betrayed them. So the onus is on him. It's not on citizens who believed important what he point, said. Absolutely. Well, right? Let me ask you this, Senator Granholm. So that's governor. that governor, Former sorry, governor. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, just that, call me Jennifer. That, that's a, that's about uh, that's about forty five. There have been some really, really promising things uh, that progressives and Democrats have been doing over the last several hundred days. Uh, let's talk about it, some of them. What about that Women's March? Oh, do you not love it? I even made my own pink hat. <laughs> that was an awesome thing. And of course, all of the marches since then. The only thing I worry about is I just want to make sure that we are not going to be worn down because I, I, I worry that people are so... Um, angry by what they see going on in the Trump White House. And, you know, I almost have to take Alka-Seltzer every day. Uh, people want to be able to, s I long for a boring president, frankly. I long for being able to sleep. So I worry that all of this anger gets, um, you know, gets used up in the first year. This, I think he's going to give us enough to keep us going, and I just want to make sure people don't lose energy or lose their momentum because that that march was a signal that this next four years we're going to have to keep on our game. But, but that hasn't been the only march. We had there was a tax day march. There right? were the airport rallies. We had a science. I march. love the march on yes. science. March, march nerds, for you know, science. I love it. Right. They were awesome. They were they were you know out there doing great stuff. And then there's another march tomorrow. that is being organized tomorrow. Uh, and I want to just say that, I don't know, what do you, what do you think, Chris? Is, do you think that, uh, that uh, if we offer the right um, organization that we can sustain this progressive energy we see out there on our streets today? I, I do. I think, uh, look, you've seen the grassroots energy bubbling up from the day after the inauguration. And um, it was great to see the most recent March for Science. And, of yep. course, math is part of science. And we know that there's Trump math and there's real math. And it is important to remind them that the day after the inauguration, there were three times as many people on right. the National Mall for that than for the inauguration. That's right. and, it's, and, it, and it's continued. And look, there are two things. Number one, I think you know every day that, that Trump goes on to betray the American people, uh, you're going to see people getting angrier and angrier, including more and more people who supported Donald Trump because they yeah. believed yeah, uh, what he said. Uh, but to your larger point, the key is to finally channel and mobilize this energy into pushing back 
the destructive Trump agenda, putting forward our own positive agenda for working people, and finally marching to the polls in 2018. Right. Because right. if we don't show up at the polls in 2018, then we can't uh, build on the momentum that we've got. You know, well, the, let, let's remind folks about that positive agenda a little bit. I mean, you know, you, you're right to say that we should not just obsess on Trump. He's bad enough. But, you know, democratic values are really awesome values. Let's talk about what some of those things are that we're fighting for right here, right now in these first 100 days. Like, for example, how we stood up and organized to defend the right for people to get medical care. I mean, we, we, we beat them back through grassroots organization and we stood up for health care. That's right. Yeah. You're going to have to do that every day, right? You are, you are drop. can I say this? You're Sit. dropping a bill next week, yep. standing up for working people on the fight for 15, that's right? That's right. right? So, I mean, that's who we are. We're about, we're about working people. We're about people who don't have billions of dollars. I mean, we'll, we'll take the billionaires too, but we're mostly about making sure that everybody has a chance to succeed. We're about the word all. And so. Like as in liberty and justice for. for all, right? All right. Yeah, right? No exceptions after that. No commas, no provisos. It's no about all. Harm. I mean, yeah, yeah, look, I think, uh, look, we want to make sure that everybody has a good paying job, the opportunity to earn a living, support their family, send their kids to college if they want, or go get the training that they right. in the workforce so they can be successful and then retire with dignity. And the reality is, if you look at the Trump proposals, he would just erase all of that. Uh, his tax plan, I know we're going to probably talk about that, no, we're but, going there. but take a look at that. I mean, that's just another total giveaway uh, to the wealthiest on everybody else's dime. And we are, we've introduced the legislation, uh, the $15 uh, minimum wage in the United States Senate. Looking forward to working with you on that. But we also uh, need to make sure that we take away the big subsidies for uh, CEO bonuses. Oh, yeah and say to them, you know what, taxpayers aren't going to be subsidizing those bonuses if you're not giving your employees Come on. a right. big pay raise. Right. Right. Because in addition to the minimum wage increase, we've got to make sure that we're creating a system that's not rigged in favor of the folks at the top, but is designed to help working people take home more pay. After all, if CEOs are getting big bonuses, <laughs> they didn't do it alone, I can guarantee that's you that. Right. They did it because of their workforce, and yeah. their workforce needs to share in those profits. Jennifer? This, you know, if you ask people what is the number one issue on almost every poll, they will say jobs and the economy, right? The economy is not just something that's out there. We craft the economy. The decisions we make about whether, for example, there is an estate tax, an inheritance tax or not, is a decision about how we craft the economy. What Trump wants to do is to eliminate the inheritance tax. And what does that go to? People, if you're a couple and you make 11, if you have $11 million that you're about to pass on, not if you have 9 million, not if you have 5 million, if you have 11 million, then, then the estate tax kicks in at every dollar over 11 million. If you're a single person, you have four and a half million dollars. That's when the estate tax kicks in. This is just like the one tenth of one percent of Americans, and they get to have the ovarian lottery by able by being able to keep all that. Well, they didn't earn it. It's not earned by them, right? That's unearned income for them. And so the question is, is aren't we all in this together? Isn't this about making sure that yes, the children of the the, the people who are living on tree-lined streets in the richest neighborhoods and the kids who are born into public housing, that we all have a chance. And sharing some of that makes us one, makes us whole as a country. To me, that's how you craft an economy, to make sure that people at all levels are able to be successful. Talking about crafting an economy, there was a time when if you said $15 an hour, people would look at you and they would scratch their head, and then if you said it again, they'd probably laugh. But because low-wage workers got out there and fought and marched and marched and fought and mm. uh, you know, the other day, I was so proud to see Chuck Schumer and Bernie Sanders and, and, and um, uh, Patty Murray uh, and members of the House all standing up there and say, we're introducing this bill, we're moving forward. As the Democratic Party is fighting for higher wages, the Republican Party is fighting to give, to cut the estate tax so that people who have benefited from this great nation don't even have to pay to sustain it and make it move forward. Look, you know, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, a really good Republican president, would That's be right. rolling in his grave uh, on this issue of the estate tax because what he argued was we cannot have an aristocracy in the United States right. that just passes wealth from right. one generation right. to right. another and forgets about all the other Americans, that we've got to have a country that works 
for everybody. And what is absolutely outrageous about their estate tax is exactly what uh, Jennifer was saying, which is that it allows those people who are already at the very top, top. simply to pass along without any kind of contribution to the rest of us this huge amassed wealth and essentially uh -huh. give a, a super head start to folks from one generation to another. That is not what America was about. America right. was about a place where everybody could come, work hard, and make it. And to do that, uh, we've got to make sure that we invest in every child, right. in That's every right. neighborhood. Right. And you know, we're, their tax plan helps the wealthy. I'll tell you, their budget, look at what they do to our education funding. Skinny they budget. cut it, they eliminate after school programs. So they're saying to the folks at the top, you know what? Um, you're doing great. We're gonna we're gonna give you an extra boost, and everybody else, tough luck. Uh, we're gonna cut your legs out from under you. So, so let me ask this question: If the Trump administration genuinely wanted to help working families, what would a tax system, a tax reform, look like? Well, I think for sure that they would enhance, for example, the earned income tax credit, which rewards work. You would make sure that you have people who have a lot. Pay, pay more, pay, I mean, that's just the bottom line, as opposed to what their proposal does, which says we're gonna give a huge break, not just to corporations, but to individuals at the top. You, you've gotta have a tax system that allows you to have the revenue to invest in, in the basics for everybody. And we, have, we, have, we share a land, we share public schools, everybody who has earned millions of dollars probably hires people that have benefited from public schools, that drive on roads that we all share, mm -hmm. that drink water that is clean because of the pipes that we all lay, that breathe air that is clean because we have invested in making sure that scrubbers are on the coal-fired power right. plants so that we're, we're healthy. These are the basics and that we've all got to share in making that sure that it's available for everyone, whether you're at the top of the income scale or not. That's right. Chris, you mentioned the budget. And uh, you know, it, when you were in the House, you were our, our budget lead. Uh, what do you, you know, can you elaborate a little bit more on what you think of this Trump budget? I mean, he wants to eliminate Meals on Wheels. He wants to eliminate the Appalachia Regional Council. What's your take on some yeah, of this? Yeah, so yeah, so on the one hand, you know, they're proposing this <laughs> windfall tax break uh, for millionaires and billionaires, people like Donald Trump. I mean, we'd like to see his tax returns so that we know whether he's really padding his own pockets Come on now. Or, or looking out for With the American tax return. people. Um, but, but, but we do know enough, even without seeing that, to know that the tax plan that he and you know, Steve Mnuchin and the millionaires and billionaires in this cabinet propose are gonna help people like Donald Trump and the people in his cabinet and not working people. Meanwhile, you're absolutely right. In their budget, what do they go after? They cut dramatically into education. Then they start a diversion fund to divert funds from public school education into private vouchers to try to undermine the public school system. Uh, they are going to undermine the ability of students to get more loans and Pell Grants. Uh, and then, very interestingly to your point, they go right after rural America. Mm, uh, what shocking. you were talking about was the Appalachian Regional Commission, yes. uh, which is in Western Maryland, parts of West Virginia. This is, these are families that are really struggling. Zero it out. They zero out investments in water infrastructure and sewer infrastructure, specifically in rural areas. And then they specifically go after uh, some of the support that helps rural airports survive so that people can uh, travel around the country. And by the way, when it comes to New Start for transit programs, they, they zero out new starts. Under the Trump budget, there will be no new transit projects in the United States. Uh, so, and that was the guy who said he wanted to build or spend our infrastructure. Incredible. So their, their budget is another example of the complete betrayal, really to the, all of the public. But I think the people who are gonna be especially surprised are people in rural areas who would have been really badly hit if he destroyed the Affordable Care Act. Rural hospitals would be just destroyed when you take those big cuts to Medicaid. And then his budget comes along right afterwards and would have, really uh, further uh, undermined uh, people struggling in those areas. So, you know, this, this budget, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna stop it. Oh, great, I mean, you know, we're all in. Let me just remind everybody that the Physician Women for Democratic Principles are backing us up tonight. We appreciate that. Next month, they're gonna be focusing their membership on giving to the DNC and our digital team has committed to matching their donations with our grassroots fundraising 
So we want you to just remember the awesome people of the Physician Women for Democratic Principles. I want to remind you, check in to Democrats Live next week. We will be back. And if you are in Washington, D.C., make sure you can come on in and join our studio audience. We'd love to have you, wouldn't we? Yeah. And, <laughs> and go to the website and make sure you can volunteer or, or, or support our efforts here. We are working hard to assert democratic principles to help the American people. So, Governor, let me just ask you, you know, you, you've led a state in our country, and as Thomas P. O'Neill, another great Democrat, once said, all politics are local. Mm -hmm. Talk about what the Trump-Ryan budget means to governors, to states, yeah. and even to local communities. And, and I think Chris did a great job of outlining a lot of that. But as you know, I mean, if you're a mayor or if you're a governor, you know, you are, you know, if you're a senator too or a member of Congress, <laughs> but you are looking into the eyes of people who every day have got to deal with the, the, you know, the struggles of just living in a country where we've got this hollowing out of the middle class. So when you cut things like uh, for mayors, the community development block grants, which yeah. helps them help them to be able to attract job providers to local areas, when you cut things like the Economic Development Administration, then that prevents you from being able to pull together the meager resources that you have to attract job providers into areas where they really need jobs. When you cut training for real people as they've tra they're transitioning from a job that maybe was automated or maybe was offshored, you eliminate a governor or a mayor's ability to help your people. If you cut, for example, WIC funding, which is what the Trump budget does for women, infants, and children, that's funding for children. I mean, what is the matter with you? And can I jump to the health care proposal that they are putting on? Because I know you want to talk about that too. But the, today, they, they introduce whatever Trump proposal number three, and today's is worse than last week's. Mm. And here's what it does. To me, this is so unbelievable. They want to give to governors the ability to deny people the, cha the, the ability to access care if you have a pre-existing condition. So what does that mean? That means if you are somebody who was diagnosed, for example, with breast cancer, you're a more expensive person, right? So they carve you out of the pool. You have to pay, on average, an extra $28,000 a year for your premium. That's just for one type of cancer. If you have metastatic cancer, if you have cancer that has metastasized, and that's your pre-existing condition, well, sure, it's much more expensive to take care of you. If you are carved out, that means you have to take care of that. You have to pay that bill all yourself. You know what that costs per year? $142,000. So if you essentially do this, cut out the ability to protect people with pre-existing conditions, you have priced those who have pre-existing conditions out of the market. How, I, I mean, I don't understand for a party, the Republican Party, who believes that they are the party, for example, of faith. I mean, in my faith, I am a Catholic, and in the 25th chapter of Matthew, the Lord says, whatsoever you do unto the least of these, so also you do unto me. How can you in good conscience vote for a bill that hurts people so terribly? This is what they want to force on governors and the country. And I say, bully for y'all for standing up for it, and please continue to fight. And I would say that applies to the folks who will be cut off of Medicaid as well, because there'll be 14 million people who now have health care thanks to the Affordable Care Act who will not have health care if this bill goes through. So, you, know so how, you know how we know that they know that their health care bill really sucks? <laughs> because they exempted themselves and their staff That's a from their sign. own bill. So well, they did add themselves back. They, they realized out of they, shame, they, they were shamed. The first for, round yes, was, and I remember round, how this yes. had, the first round was, let's try to sneakily keep us out so that we're still protected. And then everyone blew the whistle, so we see them having to retreat. But look, this is a, a bad We saw bill. what their real intentions were. Yeah, are. we absolutely saw their fingerprints all over that. That's what they did. Uh, and, you know, th 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 they retreated just like they had to retreat from passing the first, the first round. round of the but the second version is even worse. Sure oh, look, the <laughs> second version is an accommodation to the Freedom Caucus, which right. means the first version wasn't mean enough. Right. So they had to get a little meaner, a little meaner. Hey, look, you know, Adrian over there has some questions for us. But before we go to her, I'd like to just uh, ask you all, um, what's your, what, what should folks out there who uh, think about for the next 100 days? I mean, what's, come, what's on the horizon? What's coming our way? 
Go ahead, go ahead. What's coming down the pike from the, oh, well, look, I mean, we just saw that he What tried. are we going to do? What are they going to so do? So here, here's, here's what they're going to do, right? He just, he had that last minute uh, gathering. He put together his one-page tax plan, um, which, you know, the, the reality is that, uh, you know, they weren't serious about putting the work into it. But if you look at the plan, you clearly know where they're going. So they're going to actually try and ram that through the House. Uh, Steve Mnuchin, who's the Secretary of the Treasury, you know, when he was testifying for his confirmation hearing, he said, you know what, any tax plan we come up with, we're not going to reduce taxes on the, quote, upper class. That's all this thing is about when you're doing these dramatic cuts. So once again, uh, they're going after people who earn a paycheck through hard work and giving tax breaks to people who make money off of money. That's and the, the, and that's let me the just bottom say, line. Here's what we uh, got to do, and this is Congress. But this, the action in the next two years is going to be in the states. It's going to be across America. We've got states and governor's races across America. We have state house and state senate seats across America. If we want to make sure we take this country back, we have got to get people in those chairs. So run for office or find folks who are you support at the local level who are running for office sign up or link up with swing left some of these websites that have been created indivisible uh, sister district flippable they're all websites that have identified the districts that are most likely to flip both at the state level and the federal level support our effort to take our nation back that's what we got to do and now to Adrian yeah thank you now Adrian we got we got time for of questions from social media. If so you're we'll watching, take a few minutes. Yeah, let's take a yep, few of them. You can still submit. You can do hashtag Democrats Live on Twitter. So speaking of health care, our first question is from Karen in Ohio. She wrote, Can you explain why Obamacare is said to be collapsing, or is that just a buzzword? It's just it's just a it's a buzzword that it's collapsing. Obamacare is not collapsing. Uh, can it be improved? Absolutely, and all of us have put forward some ideas for how we can reduce the cost of premiums and co-pays and those kind of things. But what you're ha seeing now is a very cynical effort by the Trump administration to blow up the Affordable Care Act, both through the legislation, but also through this threat that, that Trump made just the other day, uh, where he was going to withhold funding that right now goes to help reduce people's premiums. So if, if he were to pull the plug on that, as he's threatening to do, you would see even, even higher spike in premiums. What he needs to do is join with us with some practical ideas uh, to reduce this. So he was actually taking the, all these you know, Americans hostage recently, saying that if he didn't get his way on the wall and the budget, uh, he was going to drive up the costs of health care, which would mean right. more providers would leave different areas around the country. Look. We should do a public option. I think all of us know that the real answer here is to have a public option, a Medicare for all type option that people can uh, can compete in every part of the state. So, Bravo. so let's not. Yes. Um, and you want to talk about health care? One of the other things we got to do is bring down the cost of prescription drugs. Yes. Donald Trump, he talks a good he talks a good game, but there are things we can do right now. Many of us have introduced and proposed that could dramatically reduce the cost of prescription drugs. All right, let's keep them going. Got a question from Minnesota. All right. <laughs> How will you move the Democratic Party from its old guard status quo to one that has greater appeal to the next generation? Uh, you want to handle that? That's one? yours, man. You're in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just say this about that. Look, I think we need we need everybody, right? We need we need folks who've been around, and we need the brand new energy that that we're seeing coming in every day. We don't have anybody to lose, and we need everybody. We need young, old, new. Folks who've been in the movement a long time. We need people of uh, rural areas, urban, suburban. We need everybody. We need people of all colors, all cultures, all faiths. We need independents. There are Republicans out there that see that uh, Trump is full of beans. We need we need them. We, we we need we're trying to go big tent man because everybody needs a working economy and they need to be respected for who they are. And you know, I say you know encourage the new folks, keep the folks who've been around. And let's move on like that. And, and I would say, too, there's been some incredible work on encouraging young people, for example, to run. There's a group called The Arena. And this group has been holding these pop-up conferences around the country, inviting millennials to come and raise their hand and say, yeah, I'm going to run for office. I just spoke at one in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I'm telling you, 
there were 600 people there, all like millennial age, who were, who were like from New, who were living now in New York or in you know mostly in New York and along the coast, but who were from the middle of the country and who were saying, you know what, I have a duty to go back home and run for office. We have a geographic problem. We have concentrated our party on the coast. So we want to encourage people from the middle of the country to run and, and be part of this as well. But millennials, the torch is going to be passed to you. Yes, we want the old folks. We want people in my generation. <laughs> but we really want to encourage millennials. And it's really encouraging to see that so many people are starting to raise their hand and recognize they have a duty to serve. So That's on right. a similar note, Maria asked, what are you doing to help state Democrats? Well, you know, we believe that the Democratic Party essentially uh, is based on our states. So we have, you know, we have uh, 57 Democratic parties, including 50 states plus territories in D.C., and we are interested in them help m money, training, but mostly moral support and letting them know that we believe in them, that we want their voice to be heard, and we think that their contribution is critical and that they are giving us voice from Montana, Kansas, Minnesota, Missouri, all over the country. And so our state parties are really super important. Uh, I've already been on about four calls with them, and they are always coming strong. They are organizing. They are connecting with the progressive industry uh, um, uh, movement, and uh, we're really proud of the work they're doing. And we, I would just say, for those of you who are asking the question and who are out there across the country, connect. The question is not what the DNC should be doing, but what should you be doing to Ooh, help that, your no, state party too? I mean, you don't want it to be top down. This has got to be a bottom up movement of every hamlet, town, village, city across the country and people everywhere in between. So we need you to help. Uncle Sam, Uncle Tom, Uncle Keith. Need you. <laughs> <laughs> we need you. We need you. I don't mean Uncle Tom in that sense. You know, you know what I mean. In a good way. That's Tom Perez. Let me just say, that sounded thing. bad. Yeah. You know, right. In 2018, the good news is we got to get everybody out on the streets and, and doing marches now. But as I said earlier, 2018, we need everybody at the ballot booth. That doesn't right. start on the, on the day before the election. It That's starts right. right now. It starts yesterday. So we've got all these governor's races that are up uh, in 2018, and we have 25 of the current incumbent Democratic senators up. So uh, if, if we want to be building momentum uh, to take back the White House in four years, and we want to make sure that we have a, a blue wall in That's the right. Senate to stop right. the bad things from Trump is going to try and do, we need to make sure we support those Democrats and work hard to pick up the additional three and to take back the House. So everybody needs to get out there. And we as a party need to connect more, not just by saying, hey, you know, you got to come out and support the Democrats because we're Democrats. Come out and support the Democrats because we believe in issues together. We believe in a common future for the mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. We believe in the things we've been talking about tonight. We can't expect people just to answer a call and say, come out for Democrats. We have to say what we stand for and make it clear that Donald Trump is trying to drag the country backwards. And, and if we, we do that, we do it right, we connect to people, I'm sure we will continue to sustain this movement. That's right. Adrian. So, Keith, as a new boss at the DNC, I think that this one's for you. Uh oh, here we go. It says, why is Bernie Sanders included in anything DNC? He has said he's not a Democrat and that he doesn't support the platform. Well, I, I really welcome that question. Look, we're trying to win independence, right? Mm -hmm. Independents are important to our success. We need them. We also want to reach out to people who, anybody who wants to vote for our candidates and support our values, we ought to find a way to connect with them. Again, it, this is a moment of addition. Republicans try to mm -hmm. win by subtraction mm -hmm. and voter suppression. Democrats win by including more people. And so this is exactly where we're going with this. You know, Bernie, I think, has a leadership role in the Senate Democratic Caucus. Yes, he He's working on outreach. He's campaigning with us. You know, he, all over this country, we had rallies where we had literally thousands. I think we probably had a unity rally where we talked to 25,000 people, 7,500 in Omaha. We had them all over, and Bernie helped us do that, talk to people, and it was all under the banner of the Democratic Party. So don't worry about it. It's, you know, let's figure out how we can reach out to one more voter, connect with one more person, reach out to one more person to help find their power. That's where the win is. Uh, Jennifer Graham? Yeah, I, I just, I wanted to just reinforce this as somebody who was a Hillary Clinton uh, supporter as well. I, I just think um, it is really important for us 
to not be fighting with one another. We don't have the luxury of being exclusive or purists. We want to, we want to have everybody in. And unless we are <laughs> able to say to Bernie Sanders and his supporters, Hillary Clinton's supporters, people who didn't support, people who may have supported Gary Johnson, people who may, I mean, and yes, people like in Michigan who had voted for Barack Obama and then voted for Donald Trump. We want, we them, want back. them back. And we are the party for you. If you are somebody who voted for Donald Trump, he's not going, I mean, we'll give you some time to see that he's betrayed you, but honestly, we want you back because we are the party that's talking about creating jobs in America. He may mouth about it, but if he's cutting stuff that would help us create jobs in America, he is not your guy. So I'm just saying, those are our values. We want you with us, and we cannot afford to be fighting one another. That's right. We want, that's right. That's right. We want Jill Stein voters back. That's right. Jill we Stein want, voters. We, sure. we, want, we want them back. So, uh, hey, guys, let's, let's uh, make room at the table. That's right. Uh, Adrian. Uh, how can we stop the onslaught of GOP-led right-to-work bills that are sweeping our nation and destroying labor unions? Win elections. Mm -hmm. It really no, is. Anybody want to elaborate? That's no, no, right. That's yeah. it. No, it We've got to have bodies in. I mean, it happened in Michigan, and the only reason it happened in Michigan is because they won the governor's office. They already had the legislature, and there was nothing. You know, we just got to win. We got to win these state legislative races in addition to these federal races. We have to win, win, win. And that but, means but, organize. But, but, Governor, this goes back to your point about how important the states are. Yes. Because when you look at these right to work laws, a lot of them, they're happening in Wisconsin, Michigan, Kansas, Missouri. Right. They tried to pass one in New Hampshire. The states are really key. And I think Chris and I, as federal legislators, we know that yes. uh, the states, man, are key. And, and if you're going to, if you have, if you have, uh, if, if, if you have felon reenfranchisement, it's because the states have it. If you have same right. day voter registration, That's right. it's because the states have it. If you have early right. votes, it's because the states have it. And this impacts Chris. And for me as a House member, the district lines I run in are drawn at the That's state right. level. Right. So we know we got to be in partnership with our states. What do you think about I, that? I totally agree with you. And I would say, and for something I've been work, I've worked on for years now, if you want to have a commitment to clean energy and clean energy jobs, it's the states that do that. I'm just saying all of these things. All the marriage fights different. were at the state level. If you want to have Medicaid expansion, it's at the state level. So you just really can, cannot underscore enough that while I love my brothers up here in Washington, <laughs> the action is in the states. We are all awesome. <laughs> uh, Adrian, what do you got? We got a few questions about what direction the party should go in regards to 2020 and a presidential candidate. Let's hear them. Oh, just what direction? Oh, just, just, just what, what you're thinking. Uh, let's who hear from who should we be looking to? <laughs> uh, okay, it does so, say hashtag Harris 2020. Harris 2020. Senator Harris. Oh, let me just tell you, it is not the proper, <laughs> it is not the proper role of the DNC to get involved in the primary. So we're going to get a massive army of volunteers and organizers ready for whoever comes out of that primary so that we can rock and roll from California to New York and every single place in between. But I can tell you that what we got in mind is to organize, organize, organize. I mean, Senator Granholm, I can't, I, Governor, sorry. sorry. I can't say it better than, sh than, than she said a moment ago about the need to really get out of, in the country and organize, and we cannot wait until 2018 to win elections in 2018. By the way, we got Virginia and New Jersey now, right. this year. A lot of Georgia, in two Georgia, in, yeah, two Georgia weeks, in two weeks. Municipal right. races, special elections, like we got one coming up in Montana. So there's plenty of work for us to do. We got to get busy. Registering we voters is just so critical. It's, I mean, when you think about Georgia, they've got, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of voters who are not registered, who are people of color, who might likely vote for Democrats and who could have flipped the governor's election last time. And I'm just saying, in every state, there are a huge number of voters who, might, who would be sympathetic to our, who believe what we believe and who are just not registered. So all that work has to happen before, before 2018. We need people in the field doing that. Uh, we have to dramatically increase voter turnout. And when you poll people and ask them who didn't vote, why they didn't vote, They'll often say that I was too busy. Now, what, now, now the truth is uh, that, uh, that a lot of people aren't too busy. They're working two, three jobs. But if we go to them and organize them and, and say, look, you don't get a plan. You're going to vote early. 
You're going to vote late? How, when are you going to get there? We'll what are you give gonna, you a ride. We'll give you a ride. Okay. What are you going to do with the kids? How are you going to, you know, we, you know, making a plan dramatically increases turnout. Can you vote early? You know, get that out of the way. What about souls to the polls? Vote with your congregation on Sunday or Saturday or Friday. I mean, there are all Can kind of- Can we babysit your kids? We'll, we'll look after them. <laughs> Whatever we it takes. We want you to participate in this democracy. And it's not about us just getting your vote, although that's very important. It's also about building community. It's about building an America where mm. people care each. for each other. That's right. And elections are one way we express that caring. But so, let me just say with respect to midterm elections, the, oh, yeah. the question is about 2020, and it's going to be oh, really yeah, important right. that the Democrats mobilize behind our core values and, and, a, and a you know platform that works for uh, working Americans. But I will tell you that when midterm elections, a lot of people decide, hey, they're not so important and they don't show up. There are big drops mm -hmm. among Republican voters, true. independent voters, and Democratic voters. And I'll tell you, the biggest drop off comes with younger voters, millennials. Very true. And so if we want to be ready for 2020, <laughs> we sure better show up uh, in 2018. And I think the, the things that you were talking about, Keith, are really important. People need, who have not voted in the past, need to make that pledge, make right. that commitment, and start planning ahead. And for everybody else, we need to be reaching out uh, to people who want to get engaged and make sure that they're engaged not just at the rallies, which is really important, but that they are getting mobilized for the polls. Well, hey, everybody, I think that uh we're at the end of our time. We've got time for one more. I think. Okay, we'll time for one. Yeah. Well, let's do it. Let's do it. What is being done to combat gerrymandering across the country? Great question. Any, you want to handle that one? Well, we Governor do. Grant? We do know that President Obama and Eric Holder have started an organization which is really focused on this. They're at the early stages of it, raising money, working with the state parties to try to identify first of all which states are mo have the most egregious examples of gerrymandering and start to focus on those particular states in conjunction with state parties and people across the country who have some uh, you know, high level donors who are re really want to, you know, there's a lot of folks like in California who've got a lot of money, but it doesn't matter in California. What you want to do is to make sure that you stop the gerrymandering, for example, in Michigan and, and you know, well, Minnesota probably doesn't have as much. We I do, uh, Illinois has trying. a lot. You, I don't know, do you guys have a lot? In so look, I mean, Maryland's a democratic state, but what our position is we want the whole country to right. have impartial right. line drawing. Put on a blindfold, draw the lines for the whole country uh, so that everybody has a chance and you don't have lines drawn by each separate governor and legislature right. uh, in their own way. Because at the end of the day, that means that people people's voices cannot and, be fully And in 2020, heard. if we yeah. don't have those Democratic governors in those seats in 2020, that's when the redistricting happens in years that end with zero, right, because that's the census year. If we do not do our work between now and then, we will suffer the same fate. So we're not going to have that happen. I will say, stay tuned. There's a very interesting case going to the Supreme Court uh, on gerrymandering. And um, unfortunately, um, <sighs> the Democrats had a, a, seat, a seat stolen from them on the Supreme yep. Court, uh, Merrick Garland. Uh, we now have Gorsuch, but let's 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 you know keep an eye on the Supreme Court, and they should make sure that every voter has an equal voice in this process, and that means uh, putting an end to this kind of arbitrary gerrymandering, which really ends up disenfranchising lots of people. Good news, Adrian says we have time for one more question. Adrian, what we do you have got one for more. Us? This one's for the governor. It says, "Are pro-life Democrats still welcome in the party, course. governor?" Let me just say this. We are a party of addition. I am fiercely pro-choice, and I am a Catholic. I completely understand the choice of individuals who may decide that, it's, that having an abortion is not in their conscience or not consistent with their faith. That's their choice. But because we are a pro-choice party, choice means that you welcome both sides, meaning that individuals who have a decision that we wouldn't be pro-choice if we didn't allow people who exercised a choice that might have been different from my choice. So it's the question of whether somebody is elected that makes a choice for me. That we don't like. But if, you're, if you are somebody who is pro-life and, and wants to you know, make sure that you exercise your choices consistent with your conscience, of course we welcome you into this party. We are a big tent and we are a party about addition. Thank you for clarifying that, Governor. We do welcome uh, people. And so uh, that probably brings us to the end of the yes, hour. Yes, thank you so much. Hey, everybody, go on Democrats Live. Tell a friend about Democrats Live. 
Go on the website, volunteer and donate. And a big thanks to the Women Physicians for Democratic Values. <laughs> and Something like that. And <laughs> <so big. laughs> I, you know, I said it twice. I, I know. And, 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 and so, uh, and look, we'll be back right next week with some more from Democrats Live. Give our guests a hand. Yeah. 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 Give it up for Kate. <laughs> Woo -hoo. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. 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 All right.